I want to speak to you this morning very briefly on the topic of a legacy that lasts. A legacy that lasts. Um, the word legacy means long-lasting impact of a partic- because of particular events. Long-lasting impact because of particular events. And because of that, something has passed on in character, in reputation, in lifestyle. And because of the impact, a long-lasting impact of particular events, your character, your reputation, your lifestyle is an example for others and a guide for the future for others. And it's amazing that everyone here before me in this graduating class, I can truly say that you have legacy. That when you came to Christ, a long-lasting impact was made. And by you deciding to come to Bible school and devoting two years of your life and opening the word and praying, God has deepened the impact. And you have something that you are passing on. And you have something that your character your reputation and the lifestyle that you lead will truly be an example and a guide to so many. You are our legacy. And I want to talk a little bit about that legacy. You know, it's a completely disputed fact in my family of, uh, and now I'm talking about my immediate family, my mom, my dad, my brothers, my sister. It's sort of a disputed fact of who came to Christ first. I don't know if you have those, um, ever have those dis- disputes. Uh, when I was in my freshman, freshman year at college, um, I went to an event and I really felt Christ meet me at that event. The very same year, my mother read the cross in the switchblade. And the thing is that even though we, I came home at Christmas and she said to me, you know, you have really changed and, and I thought there was something different about her, too. We were born and raised Catholic, so we had no Bible. And so, really, we had, uh, we had no Bible, and so we kind of read or fed off another story, which, ironically, was David Wilkerson. But in our early 20s, we came to a Bible-believing church. And Pastor Carter and I were recently married then, and so... I got saved, Pastor Carter got saved, my mother got saved, my father got saved, and every one of my brothers and sisters uh, came to Christ and confessed Christ. I just want to say that mercy and grace visited my fractured and hurting family. And my father, even though he came to Christ in his 60s, he, um, he had like this immediate wisdom And he suddenly became this steadying influence in our church life. He became an elder. And he was so full of hope every time he looked at young people. Even though he was just so impacted that Christ had come into his life, all he could see when he looked at people was hope because he had been so touched, found at a a later age. And it was like, if the Lord can touch me in my 60s, oh, what he's going to do when he touches people of other ages. And he was so full of hope. My mother came from a place of depression to being totally delightful. And she was funny, smart, and a loving woman who knew that was under that heavy, heavy burden of decades of depression. It was like when God visited her, she truly blossomed in her old age, in her older years, and became an absolute delight. And... um, they, my mom and dad would take all the lonely singles, sometimes misfits from church, and bring them home. And so when I got saved, I saw my mom and dad actually going out and living the gospel. And they would take the strangest people home. My dad would make them bacon and eggs every Sunday, and that's all we, we, we would have. And we would share our, our table with whoever said yes to come to their house. I can't tell you the legacy that God has given me. Even though I was a first-generation Christian and my parents were, in some ways, a first-generation Christian all at once, the, the amazing grace of God, that God allowed us to establish legacy, to say that when we get saved, we are able to reach back to those that are older 
and they join us and we're able to reach into the future. And God says, through your life, I'm going to reach people. And I'm telling you, it's such a beautiful thing when families go together. Beloved class, I encourage you, if you at this moment are from a fractured family, if you're from a place that's very difficult, return home and stand in the, in the, law, the lasting and the long-lasting impact that Jesus Christ has made in your life. Keep the discipline of prayer. Keep the discipline of reading the word. And I'm telling you, God will astound you with the salvations in your house. This is not only my story. This is everyone's story. Because it says, he who will follow Jesus will not walk in darkness. You will return with the light of Christ that will forever shine. And you will have impact. And it will be amazing. And your character, your reputation, and your lifestyle will cause people all around you to go, I want that. Because you are bringing life. And legacy is not something we do for ourselves, beloved. It's something that we do for another generation. And as young as you are, you can reach back or you can reach forward. You are perfectly poised to have impact and to have your character, reputation, and lifestyle so witness of what he has done for you by his mercy and his grace. He will be with you to keep you standing and shining and loving when you leave this place. At this moment, though, I do want to also um, honor those that have um, been raised in a legacy where mom and dad have done the right thing. And um, I just want to encourage you that when you go home and you have, you are actually building on a continuing legacy. There, I have a scripture for you, and it's Mark 15, 21. I will just read it um, for you. Um, and it says this. Oddly enough, we're starting in, an, in a, maybe what sounds like an unusual scripture. But for those that are continuing a legacy that has been handed to you, and they compel one Simon Cyrenian who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And I was thinking in this scripture that the Bible not only tells us about the name of the man who carried the cross of Jesus, they did not only tell us that it was not his desire or perhaps his plan to carry the cross of Jesus, but we do know he was the father of two boys, of Alexander and Rufus. And what was it like to have your father carry the cross of Jesus? What was it like to have your father do that? What were the discussions at the table what did he say with that firsthand experience when he was up close at the most dramatic point of history and somehow he got plucked from the crowd to do that? And what did Simon tell Rufus? What did Sh Simon show without words to his son Rufus in that life-altering, impactful legacy? In Romans 16, 13, most historians believe that Rufus mentioned there was the son of the cross carrier. And it says in Romans 16, 13, greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord, also his mother and mine. His mother is mentioned with the apostle Paul's mother. These were people that lived in incredible light and understanding for their day. There were few that had that revelation the Apostle Paul had, and this was the group that traveled with him. Beloved class and those that live in established legacy, your father and your mother have borne crosses that you do not yet fully understand, but you are their legacy. Do not lightly esteem your birthright, and do not give it away for a bowl of mixture. We see you today as choice men and women in the Lord because of their legacy. And now may I add Summit's legacy in your life. 
we couldn't be more proud of what the Lord has done in you. Stand in the power of his might and win your families and establish legacy. Stand in the power of his might and rejoice in your continued legacy. And all the days of your life, you will be a life carrier, a cross carrier, and you will have impact in your families in every way. You will win your families, you will win your generation, and you will win my grandchildren's generation. And for that, I thank you. Embrace his empowerment and shout grace to your mountains. Say, when I am weak, then I am strong. But thanks be to God who always causes me to triumph. And that is your word. Continue the legacy of faith. Now, I want to talk to you what I feel could be one of the greatest hindrances that you will face in leaving this place of living your legacy, establishing your legacy. And that is a war Of course, the students of the Bible, you know you have an enemy. Of that you know. Of that you are convinced. He's out to kill, to steal, and destroy. But I'm actually not talking about a culture war that is increasingly antichrist, although that is a war. I want to talk to you about the war within, and here is, I want to summarize it. Do not give up on yourselves. Do not give up on yourselves. Why would I say that? If you will turn with me to Matthew 16, I have something here. In Matthew 16, verses 15 and 16, the course, this, the, the scene here is when Jesus came with his disciples into the area He asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they answered, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, one of the prophets. But he turned to them and he said, who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And (laughs) Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, For flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father, which is in heaven. And here we see that, interestingly enough, Jesus calls him Simon Bar-Jonah. That is his Hebrew name. That is actually his Jewish name. And Jesus is saying, you know, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you because your nation, your people, People that surround you, they think I'm a good man, I'm a good prophet, I am somebody. But when I asked you, Simon Barjona, you gave me a revelation. Flesh and blood, your own understanding, your own reasoning, what people say, did not reveal this to you. But my Father in heaven gave you a revelation that is astounding for your time. Because the Jews would say that's blasphemy for you to say that. But you also said that you are the son of the living God. In other words, you're saying, Simon Barjona, that the God that you had this revelation from is living and active in your life. And he said to him, well done. Beloved students, you have received a lot of revelation here. Not what the typical reasoning of the day has been. But you have been in classrooms where the sky has, where it's like the, 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 everything disappeared and the heavens opened up and words from heaven entered into your soul. And it was a revelation. It was not thoughts you had thought before. It's not something you would reason. But something came to you from the full force of heaven and it forever changed you. And it's allowing you to have a legacy and a long-lasting impact that will forever hit your character and your lifestyle and your reputation. And in this revelation that was so beyond anything you thought of, you are building your life on this and it will not be shaken and taken from you. And after that revelation, the interesting thing is that Jesus calls him Peter. He says that uh, you are Peter in verse 18. And upon this rock, this revelation that you have of me, of your deep knowing of who I am to you. Upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
And what, a, what an amazing revelation is continuing. It's not even that Jesus, you are the son of the living God. It's not just even that the gates of hell, what the life you are bringing in your destiny for mankind, you cannot keep mankind out of it, that you're going to send your spirit to the misery and the depths of hell, but you're going to reveal this great truth to your people and we're going to operate in it. We're going to see hell plundered. We're going to see multiple souls saved because we're living the legacy you gave us. You are Peter and I will build my church. That's the very first time the word church is used in the New Testament. What, what is that new concept church? But I will build my church on revelation. I will build my church on you knowing who I am. I will build my church on what I planted deep in you that can never be taken or shaken from you. You are the son of the living God. But then, and we're coming to the point that I want to make for you, in Matthew 16, 21 and 23, (laughs) Peter got ahead of himself, didn't he? And Peter All of a sudden, when Jesus, from that time on, once that his disciples got a revelation of who Jesus really was, they had a revelation of God. They're not just repeating what they heard on Sunday. They're not just repeating what others say. They had a revelation, and the church is built on revelation. But all of a sudden, from that time forward, Jesus began to show these disciples with revelation how that he must go to Jerusalem, He must suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests. He must be killed and he must be raised on the third day. And he began to speak his mission to these people. Clearly, he didn't hide it. It wasn't buried in obscure scripture. They didn't have to try to discern his words. He said it clearly. Here's the mission. Here's the mission and why I came to this earth. Then Peter took him and began, okay, that, if you look at that word, what Peter did was he took him aside. And now he's going to be teacher to Jesus. I'm embarrassed. He, he's going to be teacher to Jesus. Pride made him switch roles. And worse, in the, new, in the King James, it says he rebukes Jesus. Verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned, Jesus, and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are an offense unto me. For you savor us, or you don't taste the things that be of God, but those that be of men. And in his pride, he feels he understands what Jesus needs. He feels he understands. He wants to bring a little clarity to Jesus' words. He wants to say, oh, no, 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 no. See, I have this revelation of you now, but he didn't understand how incomplete it was. I have this revelation of you now, and I get it, Jesus, I get it. You've talked to me clearly. You actually talked to me personally. I actually have the revelation. You gave it to me, and I'm a rock, and I'm going to build this church, and actually the gates of hell are going to be plundered. I get it, Jesus, so can I just give you a few words of Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto you. And now if he's a prophet, he truly is speaking from his own heart. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan, you're an offense to me. (laughs) Okay, this blows me away because what a change and what a range. In very short scriptures, he's called Simon, then he's called Peter, and then he's called Satan. Okay, please don't misquote me. He's going, is she calling us Satan? What I'm saying is that all in one day, we literally can have a Simon day, a Peter day, and a Satan day. All together. We can get it so wrong. And here's what I want to tell you, oh, Bible school students. We'll have an ordinary day, revelation days, and then there will be days because you are called, because you are people of legacy, because God has a plan and a future for you far beyond everything you can think or dream about. The enemy will come against 
and try to move in all those that want to move forward the kingdom of God. Try to move us in pride. Try to get our own understanding of things that need to be deeply challenged. Are you a leader? Am I a leader? Then I'll tell you something. What will haunt you and what will stalk us is pride and the desire and the need to be deeply, deeply challenged on our understanding of things, of spiritual things. And you know something? God's not mad at us. And you know something? It's the best thing that could ever happen to us. And you know something? He's doing it because we're worth it. Because if you are called, this will come against you because you're called to plunder as I am hell. And the enemy will come and want us to move in pride and want us to move in places we need to be deeply challenged on our understanding of spiritual things. But that's because he loves us and that's because he's training us. And when you hit difficulties leaving this place and you go to lead and your ministry of living for the benefit of others that God wants to favor, when you hit a wall, when you hit something that's hard, you and I go, just a minute, well, just one minute. Am I operating pride or am I being deeply challenged on a spiritual understanding that I need to know something about? But when all that happens, beloved, here's what we also know. Our actions don't control God's character. Our responses do not control God's character. As you know, as you can preach this back to me. Your worst day does not make you any less accepted by God. The prodigal son covered in pig's mud mud does not make him less a son. Your bad day does not change God. But when we are humbled, that bad day can change us. And Jesus never stopped loving Peter. So therefore, he never stopped working with Peter and through Peter. Beloved, don't give up on yourself. If you are called, yes, you will have these moments like Peter. We get ahead of ourselves. Why? Because the same calling on Peter is on you. You are legacy. You are called to make an impact. You are going to move out. And you and I will experience the same kind of opposition. And if we fold because the enemy goes, well, this time we have crossed the line. I mean, really, I just got called Satan. I mean, I just got called out. I'm on the enemy's side. No, we're not on the enemy's side. No, we're not. We are being formed to be that tip of the spear that is piercing the darkness and pushing back the darkness. And we will be challenged the same way. So hallelujah. We get to go whenever I'm moving forward and opposed. Am I operating in pride? Forgive me, Lord, because the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Is there something I don't see? I really think in all my goodness or my understanding, I've got it, God. I know what you are doing. No, there are chances that we need to be deeply challenged on some ways that we think. But God is faithful. And he is loving us. He is training us. Nothing changes. Do not give up on yourself. Do not give up on yourself. Do not give up on yourself. God has appointed you for a time such as this. And you are being sent out in the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. You are legacy. Do not give up on yourself. And finally, I want to say this. Pastor Carter, I said, I don't know, I don't know what to say. Baccalaureate, I don't know, God, what should do? And so Pastor Carter just, well, you know, really, you should just really speak to them about um, Daniel 11.32. But the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And he's, he's just kind of throwing it off like that. He goes, now you have to define what it is to be d- strong and, you, and what it is to be no and what it is to do exploits. There, you have your message. So Pastor Carter... <laughs> See, you get two for one with us. I'm just saying. (laughs) Daniel 11.32. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. The ESV says, take action. And so I close with this, beloved. The people that know their God, that know him. That know means not just profess him, but possess him. Not just profess him, but possess him. And he possesses you. you. They They shall be strong. You will be given strength in strengthless places. They shall be strong and do exploits, take action. 
I could break that down, but you know what I'd rather do? I would rather remind you of Yale University. I would rather remind you that when our freshman Zephaniah lit up walking around the Yale campus, witnessing fearlessly and compassionately for Christ, I would say that's somebody who knows their God and does exploits. When our senior Sumbal stood up in prayer, challenged the power of darkness, prayed down heaven to the point that there was a report of healing in the classroom, I would say, I will show you, I will show you what that looks like. Beloved class of 2023, you came in under the year of transformation and God has done that. You are leaving under the banner, the year of signs and wonders. And I have seen signs and wonders among you. Do not give up on yourself. Promise me you will not give up on yourself. There is nothing to give up except fear. There is nothing to give up except fear. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know your God. You will be strong in him and you will do exploits because you want to know something in the worst of days, you'll know what to do. God keeps speaking to me. Keep this book open. Keep me praying and you will be strong and you will take action and you will do exploits. You are our legacy and we couldn't be more proud. And I just want to say, as you don't give up in yourself and you remember who you are, a living impact, a long lasting impact because of the events that have happened to you, salvation, obedience, opening your heart, learning to pray. We do it all imperfectly beloved. And you know what the imperfect part is? Our humanity and Jesus loves our humanity. So guess what? This whole thing, we're perfectly imperfect and it's good with God. So go in the power and the strength of his might. I just want to say this. You walk down an aisle to take your seat, sabbatical Sunday, so that we could honor you. And it is our joy to honor you.